So there are a few things that uh, I think we need to do before we get into quantum algorithm. Right? So I think you guys have some basic understanding. There are a few things. Like I said, we have to get into complex numbers. Okay. Within complex numbers, there are at least two parts we need to get into. Some basic arithmetic we need to understand, which we will do today. Then we have to get into some basic calculus and linear algebra using complex numbers. Okay, so that's some basic stuff you have to do. You will have to do some mechanics. Okay, when I say mechanics, see what happens is, and you guys can hear me right on the on the whatever on the call. Yes, Tony. Yeah, okay. When you say mechanics, typically you talk about new Newtonian, right? We do Newtonian mechanics, okay? Unfortunately, there are two more that we don't do, or most people do, but forget, uh, which is Lagrangian and Hamiltonian. Anybody remembers these names at least? No? Third knot. Second one rings a bell. Good. Little more than ringing bells. Today we will see. Okay, there is Lagrangian. Typically, when we talk about mechanics, there is Newtonian, Lagrangian, Hamiltonian, and quantum. Okay, that, that's how the, the historical evolution has been. Uh, we don't need all. We Of course, these in themselves are, you know, you can study years about each one of them, but we're going to have there's some introduction that's required to Lang Lagrangian and some introduction required to Hamiltonian because. In quantum mechanics or quantum computing, we'll be using certain operators, Lagrangian operators and Hamiltonian operators and things like that. So we'll have to know what this is. Okay. Then there is some probability stuff also that we got to do. Okay. Today I was thinking we can hopefully cover some basic complex theory, complex number theory, and some basic Lagrangian theory, which is what I will cover today. Next class, I'll cover some calculus of complex numbers, calculus of variations, they call it. Okay. It's actually called calculus of variations. I think that is also used in Lagrangian. Whatever little I need, probably I'll talk today, but I'll talk a little more depth next time around. Okay. We'll do calculus and we'll do Hamilton. Then I will take another hour on probability. Probability uh, theory. Essentially, you can think about it like fundamentals of measure theory. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about fundamentals of measure theory. Once we do that, I think we will be ready to get into some quantum algorithms, basically some quantum gates, quantum circuits, and quantum algorithms. Okay, that's the the idea at the end of this is for me to take you through Shor's algorithm. Okay, at least one algorithm I want to take you through. And then we should try and write some quantum algorithm for, let's say, sorting or searching or something like that, which I also don't have an idea. We'll have to do it together. Okay. Uh, so I'll also learn. You guys also learn. Hopefully, we'll all learn together. So, so that, so that's kind of the goal. Okay. Anybody thinks about something else? Let me know. That's what at least I was thinking over the next uh, holidays before Jan first, or or, or or maybe just after Jan first. Uh, because I don't know how available I will be during the last week. Okay, so we'll see about that. Okay, depending on my availability. Does that sound okay, guys? Okay. On phone, you can also talk. Okay. See, it's difficult to prepare slideware because slideware for some of these, especially for these equations and things, it's very, very difficult to prepare slideware. I can write it down, but if you have to prepare slideware, I have to use latex notation and do that. That takes, uh, it takes me like uh, half an hour to do one slide. If I do 30, 40 slides, that's like an entire week of work that I should prepare slides on. Okay. So before I get there, so let me start with complex numbers first and then we will do. Uh, Lagrangian, okay? Okay. First, as usual, a little bit of history and story is always good. Okay. So typically, how are you taught complex numbers? Right? Typically, in schools or colleges, they will say uh, the discriminant of the 
of the solution for quadratic equation, right? Which is, if you remember what, minus b plus or minus b square minus 4 is by 2a, the classic uh, quadratic formula that you have and people tell you that uh, at some point the, the discriminant, uh, when b square minus 4ac is negative, you don't have a solution. Okay, that's how people, most colleges or most schools will tell them. Unfortunately, the problem is that's all wrong. Okay. It usually starts with factorization and yeah. you fail to yeah, get the it, roots. Yeah. Uh, and then they, they will come to something where x square plus 1 is a factor. And then you'll say x square plus 1 is a factor, so x square equals minus 1. What to do with x? That's the standard uh, notation of, uh, standard way of explaining this problem, right? Unfortunately, it is wrong. <laughs> it is wrong both historically and, and that's not the way complex numbers came into being. Okay? And, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I always like to understand the history of something before, before I understand something. Okay, because that, that helps me. I don't know if it helps you. I won't take too much time. Five minutes is what I will take to talk a little bit about this. Uh, I've written down some notes here just so that I don't I don't remember the names of these Italian fellows. <laughs> they're all they're all Italian people from from 1200s. Okay, so I don't remember all of those names. So. Uh, so our story begins somewhere in 1200s, okay? 1200 is 13th century. That's the other confusion that they had for a long period, but somewhere in the 13th century, right? So there was a guy called, uh, what was his name? His name was Del Ferro, <laughs> okay? Somebody called Del Ferro. These names are not important, okay? These names you can forget, they were lost to antiquity. Now, this guy was a mathematics professor at the University of Pisa. The story is interesting. That's why I need to tell this. Now, this guy, historically, so if you look at a cubic, okay, how do you write a cubic? A cubic typically is ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d equals zero. This is a cubic, right? And finding the solution for cubics has been an obsession with humanity from at least the Egyptians and beyond. Okay, people have always been trying to, 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 to solve cubics, right? So you do understand how do you solve a cubic, right? In the, so for example, if I, if, I, if I write something like this, 26x square plus x equals 27. For example, if I write this equation for you and ask you to solve for x, modern ways you put that stupid formula. Yes. But that is not the way people solved it, right? People actually said, let there be a square of side x, right? So you make a square of side x, multiply it with 26, plus add a line of x. What does a line of x mean? You just make it a rectangle. Something here, p, x, p. And then you, and this length and this length is the same. So you add it here. Correct. And then you are going to see for what value of x this will become 27. So they will cut and paste and actually see the values and then x turns out to be 1 here, right? That's the answer here. But, but that is the way people solve. People did not solve with formulas because people had actual farms. The problem, <laughs> the oldest problem is taxation. You want to tax land. <laughs> so if you want to tax land, you got to figure out the area of land. How do you find the area of land? Land is mostly squares or rectangles. So this is what it is. So if, if the king said, get me 100 gold coins, then somebody had to figure out how should you divide the farm so that you can finally tax them 100 coins. And, and that was the solution to all of this problem, right? So people, people forget that for most of humanity, taxation was the reason why you did math, right? Why the reason you saw these equations was to tax people. Unfortunately, that has not changed. <laughs> You still do a lot of math for taxing people. But anyway, cubes create a problem. But similarly, they can, you can solve it for cubes also, right? So instead of rectangles, create cube shapes. Create cube shapes, put cube shapes, cuboid shapes, and then measure the volume. Painful process. But the same, of course, you get a fourth dimension, you can. If I write x4 here, you're done. But till x cube, you can do that. And people were trying to solve a general equation of this form. For 10,000 years, we couldn't. There was no 
a lot of uh, ancient indian mathematicians also we had some answers see there were certain forms of these cubics where there were solutions okay which is called a depressed cubic what's a depressed cubic this doesn't exist so if you have just the cubic form and the linear form then it's called a depressed cubic depressed cubics had solutions or variants of depressed cubics had solutions but a, a full blown cubic never had a solution okay now the legend goes that del ferro somewhere in 13th century found a general solution to depressed cubics okay in back in those days like today people don't write their mathematical explanations they don't explain to the world the reason they don't is because if they say, the, the way mathematics used to work at least in pre renaissance italy was if you are a mathematician your job was not very secure some other guy will come in and say oh i challenge you and then he'll give you some problems and you're supposed to give him some problems and if you he solves more problems than you can then you take his, his position and you are usually beheaded <laughs> okay that's just the way <laughs> most sciences work in pre renaissance europe okay when you talk about it so so if you knew a general answer you would keep it to yourself you will never say it because then whoever comes to challenge you you can give him those problems he can't solve it you win it and you keep your position right makes sense right people if 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 del ferro told the solution then everybody would be Would, would know that there is no advantage with with that far. Anyway, yeah. I don't want to take too much time. So this guy pretty much was on his deathbed, and um, he told one of his students, his name was Fiona, uh, the solution to this problem, okay, how to do this. Now that Fiona guy was a bit of an idiot, okay, in the sense even though he knew this, he was not a great mathematician. He probably knew one formula that his master told him on his deathbed, but he was not a great mathematician. But this guy wanted a job, and he challenged a mathematician called. forget his name again what is his name tak tai ji or somebody okay uh, he 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 challenged him but, but he lost the challenge the guy was it this guy gave him this cube, depressed cubic problem but tak tai ji was so good that he came up with his own proof because he, he he was a proper mathematician when he was asked to solve this problem he came up with his own proof and he solved all this equation of course this guy couldn't solve one problem so the other guy gave him because he was bit of an idiot right and so anyway so that's where the story goes that the cubics were kind of getting on and things like that and uh, the start up guy also never told anybody now there is a guy that i told about when i talked about quantum mechanics or quantum computing the first time i called cardano you remember i said giraldo cardano probability okay and complex numbers so that guy see that guy was not a professional mathematician that guy was a pro, was a was actually a professional metal worker they used to and a gambler and whatever so he was so he was not worried right see he was not a professional mathematician so he was okay to let other people know what he knew because uh, nobody would challenge him he was not a professional mathematician with a position in a university so that that guy was after the stata he came for a long time to give him the proof and things like that which he never gave uh, but at some point and we don't know exactly the story goes that this guy blackmailed him and got the <laughs> actual proof and the equation from the tatagle guy this, this guy got it, okay but he was made to swear that you can never tell it to the outside world okay you can never tell it to the outside world and, and things like that but this guy later on met the son in law of his original guy del ferro and he gave him his paper so he came to know that this guy was not the guy who originally devised it so in which case he went and published it there was a duel and that guy got killed so it's an interesting story but but that's how the first mention of complex numbers comes up okay in a book in the 15th century so till that point there was no complex number in fact one of the defining problems is to find out two numbers it's very interesting this problem uh, was unsolved for close to 500 years find two numbers the sum of which is 10 and the product is 40 okay later on homework try it out sum of two numbers So sum is 10 and product is 40 you will actually get into complex numbers if you try and solve this okay uh, the, the solution will exist in the complex area but anyway that's fine that was the, in 1500s that was a solution written a problem written and finally the solution was given because you could solve it bit of history so good so now all of you know the history part of it 
I hope I didn't bore you guys on this. Okay, this was something that's an interesting story. I just wanted to tell you guys a little bit. So now let's get into proper complex numbers okay, without wasting time. After this, I'll also give a puzzle. I think for how many electrical engineers are here? Anybody with electrical electronics? Good. Electronics, good. Hey, on the phone, anybody who's got electronics? I'm from electrical engineering background. Who is this? Anik? Yes. Ah, I'm going to give a nice problem to you. I was solving, see, my son is in 12th. I was solving some old JE paper, okay, for him. And I found a problem that I found very, very interesting. Okay. Uh, it took me a while to actually get that right. So, I wanted to see how many electrical engineers remember that problem. Okay, it's not a, or electronics also. In fact, every engineer should remember it is not so difficult. Okay, but having said that, I will particularly I like uh, I like making fun of electrical engineers. So that's fine. Don't 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 worry about it. So complex numbers. I, 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 I don't worry, guys. You know, when I say things like that, I just mean it out of fun. I'm not really. So how do you define the set of real numbers, right? x where x is square greater than equal to 0, right? This is how you define the set of real numbers, very simple, where right? uh, the square has to be greater than 0, right? Now, typical thing, like I said, is discriminant x square plus 1 equals 0, x square equals whatever, uh, uh, minus 1, so x equals to plus or minus square root of minus 1, right? That's the classic answer. Now, the bigger question that has existed through mathematics and to a, to a long time, even today, is are these just mathematical curiosities or is there some meaning to this? Right? Because, uh, because if you if, if you really think about it, initially we had integers, right? And then we had uh, fractions. Okay, so I don't know, you want to divide um, uh, a cake among three people? Each one gets x by 3. Right? The cake is x, x by 3. Now, the same kind of problem, right? Does it make any sense? The average number of children in America is 2.5. But do you have 2.5 children? No. Children are either, you only have integer children, you have only whole number children, but the average will be 2.5. So, does that make any sense? Right? What does it mean to say the average number of children is 2.5? Uh, so, questions like that abound. Right? Uh, what sense does it have? Similarly, the question is this. Is x something root of plus or minus 1? What does it mean? And a lot of people said that this is meaningless. Right. So I'll just give you a small motivation to say why some of this actually makes sense. So if you actually have some equation like this, y equals e power rx, something like that, where r is, let us say, uh, a real number, where r is a real number, e equals rx. This is a very, very uh, standard equation in math, right? Where anything that that moves like that is is basically an exponential function, right? E power r x, uh, wherever r can be, and it and it occurs in all sorts of natural phenomena, right? Starting from uh, if I have hundred rupees and uh, if I pay an interest uh, at some regular intervals, what will this amount to after? x number of time periods the equation that was always this right if there is some population of rabbits and if they reproduce at some rate how many rabbits will you have at the end of x time period similar thing okay uh, you have a planet moving around the sun and if i say um, what is the amount of area swept by that planet in in regular periods of time in its orbiting through the sun you will be able to get it into some sort of form which is e power rx form. So it's a very, the reason I'm saying all of this is, see, this is a very naturally occurring phenomenon. It is not something that is uh, esoterically, mathematicians have not made this up somewhere. In fact, you know how e came up, right? You guys know how e came up? Yes. Does anybody know how? Yes. How, how it became, how did e come up? It's a very strange and weird number, right? 2.718 transcendental number. Why, where did this number come from? Anybody knows on the phone? Where did E come from? It is known as Euler's number, but Euler did not invent it. 
it is named Euler's number of, in honor of Euler. But Euler did not do this. Anybody on the call? You should learn this. Interesting actually, actually, I, I, uh, I did. Uh, uh, you already go. Forgot, right? That's the whole problem. <laughs> uh, tell me. Tamachari. Yes, sir. Tell me, you were trying to say something? Uh, uh, no, sir, no idea. Actually, we oh, had, yeah. but uh, it's long back. <laughs> Parketing so is natural, don't worry. Uh, uh, a number continuously, if you're doing something, it yes. ends up with that number. Yes, okay. yes, you're right. You're, you're basically, yes, the idea is kind of sort of there. Yes, but not fully. No, I have uh, yeah. read somewhere, but you know, I, I, I forgot. Bits and yes. My, I used to have a professor in physics who used to teach me, and he used to tell me, forgetting is a natural state. <laughs> Lowest potential energy, right? <laughs> Yeah, so it is a natural state. So forgetting is not a crime. In fact, remembering is criminal. <laughs> because remembering means you are putting additional energy. Otherwise, you will forget. Lowest potential energy, you shouldn't remember anything. So don't worry about forgetting. Anyway, anybody else has an idea what E is? Quickly? No, nothing. Jacob Pernoli, ever heard the name? Uh, you cannot study high school math without remembering Pernoli's. Everything is a Bernoulli theorem, Bernoulli theorem, this Bernoulli, that Bernoulli, they're all Bernoulli's. <laughs> family of Bernoulli's. So you can't read, you can't read high school math and physics without, or even chemistry for that matter, without really knowing Bernoulli's. So one of those Bernoulli's, he was Jacob Bernoulli. This particular guy was a Jacob Bernoulli. Okay. So the son of the, the Bernoulli, in terms of whatever you have, the chemistry and physics theorems. So this guy wanted to be a banker, not wanted to be a physicist. So he had a simple question. If you take one currency of money, okay, gave it an interest, okay, of 10% every single time period, what would that number be? If you if you kept on doing it infinitely, it's a strange thing, but it will be a convergent series. It will not become infinity. It will converge to E. It will converge to 2.718. Okay, if you give it infinite number of time periods. Why that happens is a very, very interesting story. I'll not get into that right now. But that's something also that you should see. It's a converging series. See, you should read series. Converging, diverging series. It is so interesting that after a while you'll get lost in that. Okay. Because it's very counterintuitive, right? If you keep on adding numbers, you should think that it should become infinity. But it doesn't. They, it, it comes to a limit. Why does it happen? It's, it's very counterintuitive. If I add numbers, it will become infinity. If you keep on adding an infinite series of numbers, why should it converge to anything? Firstly, what does it mean to converge to something? We'll also talk about that in Hamiltonian, but anyway. Okay, so e power rx, right? Now, in nature, you'll have a lot of equations where things like y plus y double dot equals zero. Why does, see, I'm going to use this notation from now on because in quantum computing, you should get accustomed to this. Okay, y double dot is the double derivative. Is the, is the second derivative. Is the second derivative of some variable. When I put one dot, it is one. That's the fir first derivative. Two dots is second derivative. Uh, we will typically not go beyond second derivative. Okay. Some cases I might, but typically I won't go beyond. So this is a sort of equation that is very, very important in physics. All over the place you will see this. A particle moving where a particle's displacement and it's a second derivative will equal a constant. You will kind of see this all over. Even Newton's laws can be derived from this equation. So when you take this and when you plug this in and you will see, you will see all sorts of fun things. Right? Because you will see e power rx plus what? The first derivative is r, then second r squared. R squared e power rx. Correct? Second derivative is the e r x plus e r square e power r x. Now you can kind of do this. If you equate this to zero, you can take all sorts of fun things, right? You take e r x out, one plus r square. Either e power r x equals zero, or you or or r is equal to you got your fun complex numbers coming back. So it is just to tell you that this has a very very real implication. Okay, we keep talking imaginary numbers. There is nothing imaginary about them at all. There is nothing imaginary. They are as real as any real. It is very unfortunate to be calling imaginary numbers. 
in fact if there's one thing in math that i could change i will change it will not call them imaginary everybody starts thinking there is something funky about it which we mean it is exactly the same thing as so say so if you are trying to describe anything starting from rabbit populations to interest rates you will you will run into this equation okay in fact a lot of people maybe did not figure out if you actually try and predict covid infections if you, if you actually try and fit a curve to covid infections you will get this term plus a lot of other complex terms but you will have this also it will not be just y plus y double hat it will be x sin theta y plus x square whatever whatever so there will be other non linearities involved but if you are trying to see the growth of anything in a population it will typically get into this mode okay so e, so even if you are trying to model any of those things of course electrical engineers you guys spend all your life doing this because right? everywhere in circuits you will you, you will get this you will get flux will be maybe an equation like this so i hope i have convinced you a little bit this also if you put r equals i here minus i here e equals uh, minus i x type of thing okay uh, are you getting the famous euler's equation now where x equals pi e power minus i pi equals minus 1 e power minus i pi plus 1 equals 0 the famous Euler's equation. So in, in all of math, is considered the greatest equation in all of math because it is covering you. I, I pi sorry. It combines three most interesting things: e, i, and pi in one equation in math. See, e comes from growth of populations. I comes from roots of polynomials. Pi comes from circles. Three very very different things if you really think about it, but all of those three come beautifully together in one equation, which says e power minus i pi plus one. This is your first homework. Next time I want to see the proof of this. This was applied in uh, this uh, ACBC Joseph's method. Oh, good. So now I will really ask you. Yes, <laughs> yes, this comes all over. Okay, good. Electrical engineering is a good engineering. You should be electrical engineer. Theorem that I want to get to today, so we'll have to move quick. And you know, you you know, Demos there, right? Yes, I remember it. You remember it? Fine. So you five minutes away. So you five minutes away. Demos there. No, no, it's good exercise. It's not very simple. It's not very complex actually. Think about it while I'm talking. Okay, there are a few uh, properties that you have to be very very clear. Okay. So now, if I say x1 plus iy1 
equals x2 plus i y2. Okay, if I if I write this equation, then in complex number it's very simple. You have to assume that implies x1 equals x2 and y1 equals x2. It's very simple, but you got to know this. Okay, because tomorrow when when we discuss about this, this is implied. Again, I'm not going to be proving these things in this class. If you are interested, all exercises are very easy to prove. See, and always remember, there are three types of proofs. See, the other thing that I find a lot of people get confused, inductive, deductive, and by exception. So, the three, any proof. So, inductive basically means you prove something for the simple case and induce it for higher arms. Okay. Deductive basically means you prove it for some case and then say because it's proved for a higher order case, the lower order cases are okay. And exception simply means you take something and you say this is, if for example, if I have to prove it, I will have to say that, okay, x1, y1 is equal to this, but let us assume that x1 is not equal to x2. By contradiction, you prove that. Okay, that's all. So only three ways of proving it. And you got to build your muscle on those slowly if you want to get into serious stuff. So these are very simple proofs. If you want, you can just do it by contradiction. In one second, you will get this proof. Okay. It is not something that uh, the, the second one is also very, very simple. The second one is just some real number multiple of x plus i y equals r x plus i r y. That's all. Associated product. It just goes inside. Okay. Just all of this. Okay. There is nothing else. Here, we will actually have to, I will give some geometric interpretation is important for you guys to make some sense of it. Okay. See, what were real numbers? One line. See, the real number line, you said zero, a negative, a positive, uh, and the rational numbers. And everywhere. So natural numbers include zero, some people fight, some people don't fight, but whatever, over history, and, and these are all rational numbers. In between, you have some irrational numbers also, which we actually don't understand, but we say that that forms part of a real number, which has rational and irrational. And then you also have some weird transcendental numbers, which are completely weird, okay, which we don't know at all, but still those. So basically, set of natural numbers, plus set of rational numbers, plus set of irrational numbers, plus set of transcendental numbers. Gives you your real number line. Okay? But all of them lie on one line. Very, very simple. Right? Geometrically complex is a plane now because you are having two x and y. So this was just a line. So you just extend it. So the geometrical interpretation you should simply remember is this. And this gets important as you get into a lot of other things. It's, it's not complex, but you should know this. This you can talk, take as the x. This you can take as y. Correct? x plus i y. You see, this is the imaginary axis. It's called the imaginary. This is just the real number axis. So you just put it and then you draw a line. Right? If, if you draw this now, let us say this is the point x comma y. Okay. So the so the a complex number is represented as this two tuple x, y, where it is represented as x plus i, y. Now, if you think about it, okay, so this is what, if you, if you assume, this is x, and, and this is y, right. Now, this is your Cartesian coordinates, right, x and y. Now, we'll talk about polar coordinates. If, if I want to write it in pol polar coordinates, and this is probably the most important set of coordinates that we actually end up using, right? And we'll see why. For example, your De Moore's theorem, if I have to prove it in Cartesian, it's a five page proof. In polar coordinates, a one line proof. So, polar coordinates just means what? If the length of this is r, some r, and, and this angle is theta, okay? So, this is what? r cos theta, correct? And this is what? r sin theta. So x and y can also be written as r cos theta r, r sin theta. Correct? Because the, the oldest greatest theorem on earth, Pythagorean theorem, you just define this. And and what is r? 
x square plus y square. Correct. Again, the great Pythagorean theorem. Or if you want to put interested, r square cos square theta plus r square sin square theta. Which is again, it becomes r equals or is plus or minus square root of r square. Sin square theta plus cos square theta is 1, right? So, your so thing is plus or minus r square. Here we take only plus. Because it is a magnitude. You have defined it in a polar coordinates. Because I have defined r to be in polar coordinates. In polar coordinates, r always stands for the magnitude of the vector that, that you are talking about. With this, I don't know if you have realized or not, I have killed a lot of birds with this one stone. Okay. One, one bird that I have killed is I have basically said complex numbers are, the set of complex numbers are vectors. I have made the set of complex numbers a vector space with because the moment I can define this magnitude and direction, it is a vector space. It is, once it becomes a vector space, everything that I know about vector spaces comes here, okay, which is fundamentally very, very good. Now in the next, I am not yet done, but in the next thing, I will also make it a function space. I tell you why complex numbers are a function space. So once you know that complex numbers are both a vector space and a function space, then you can start having fun with it because because you need you need those things for to get into the next part which is the calculus of complex numbers right because when i have to do calculus i have to assume that it's a function space if i cannot define functions on a space then i cannot do calculus on that space okay uh, yeah so anyway so right now we are at vector space not yet a function space we'll get to how it is a function space right now let us see a few other things let us probably see Multiplication and division, they are also very important in complex numbers, how they work. Okay. Uh, guys on the call, again, anything you have, please feel free. I am I'm sorry for doing it like this, but uh, next time we'll have tech technology, which Raju will enable. <laughs> I'm very bad with technology that way. Okay. So, what is this? Okay. So, if you have A plus B, I. C plus T i. Two complex numbers, right? And I'm trying to multiply it. This becomes what? If you multiply, see the multiplication is simple. A C, A D i, B C i, B D i square. B D i square is minus B D. Right? So it becomes here A C minus B D. Correct. The, the rest of the terms will have the complex number, which is I, B, C plus A, D. Correct. So this is the multiplication of two complex numbers. Okay. Again, it simply follows this. So if you really think about it now. Since I square So if you kind of think about it, special case, if you, if you kind of think about the special case, which is probably very important, A plus B, I into a minus bi. What is this? a square plus b square. Correct. What is a minus a square a minus b square is a plus b into a minus b, but here because b square this becomes a one. So it becomes so a square. So this is a very important case. It's simple, it's not difficult, but you should remember because in quantum circuit theory, we won't talk about this, it's all be implied. I will just write square and we'll, we'll just keep factoring it out. Okay, so you know what, how the hell is uh, Srini factoring like that? He's factoring like this because of this property, this special case. Okay. The, and this will always be greater than or equal to zero. Why? Because this is the modulus of A plus B. The R, R square, right? So the modulus. So it will always be. So these are some properties which I will take for granted when we get there. And, 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 and that's why we are talking about it. And this guy has a special name. It is called the complex conjugate. This guy has a special name. For a, for a complex number A plus B i, 
A minus B i is called the complex conjugate. And it is important again because in terms of uh, uh, in terms of a lot of equations, you, you will start talking about complex conjugates, right? So complex conjugates. See, another way to understand this is very simple. If you have a complex plane like this, if you have a vector r theta, right? A plus B i. So if you kind of think about it, A. Right. So what is A minus B i? Just a reflection. Correct. Same A, but minus B. So geometrically, to imagine a complex conjugate is a reflection on the real axis. As if you take a vector, you reflect it on the real axis, which is the x-axis. If you reflect a vector on the real axis in the complex plane, you get the complex conjugate. Not very difficult, but important to remember all of these things. See, that is the thing. Uh, in mathematics, the thing is, if you forget one step, no later on steps, everything seems like magic. Right? There is no magic. It's all very, very simple. Just got to keep the basics. And that's why I give a couple of days between lectures also. That's because I expect someone to go back and think about what I have said for a little while. Right? So that it, right? Like I said, it's not lowest potential energy. It's a little higher. So that is what it is. Think about it. These are not complex concepts. But tomorrow, if you, for example, that day, I think um, Madhu only was teaching a class and I found it funny, right? Because uh, K nearest neighbors and K means, for example, they will get confused all the time. K means is an unsupervised learning algorithm. K nearest neighbor is a supervised learning algorithm. But you got to, you know, it's a very, very simple concept. But if you are not paying attention, you say, oh, K means K, or both have K in them. <laughs> in that area, you just have to be clear. Okay? Sorry, Madhu, for bringing it up. Okay, I just remembered it. No problem. You are able to see Madhu? Not so well, I think. No, no, but this is actually helping me when I'm writing with my pen. So I'm remembering a couple of things which I would have otherwise forgotten if I was looking at the... Let us talk about division portion. Yeah, because see, for me, it's very difficult to teach some of these on PPTs. To be very honest, okay? I'm not so much of a PPT person. Maybe even in BIM you would have realized. No, no, actually, uh, this is working very fine for me. I don't know for the others on the phone, but this Good. is working fine. Yeah. So now, one way to understand this is, if you have to do this, if you have to do the division right, in complex numbers, you've got two complex numbers and trying to divide one by the other. The way to do this is complex conjugates. That's why we talked about it the last time around. Okay, so multiply by A minus BI into A minus BI. So what happens? So you get C plus DI into a minus b i divided by a square plus b square. Correct? So you kind of break it down a little bit. This will become a c plus b d uh, plus whatever I don't remember if you break down plus i into a d minus b c by a square plus b square. Now the only case where this is not valid is where this is zero. So where both A and B are both equal to zero. When A and B are both equal to zero, anyway, even this division is not allowed. Okay, so uh, always in math when you're proving anything, look for division by zero. <laughs> that is the only case where everything breaks down. Okay, mathematics itself breaks down at that point. So you have to be very, very careful. But, but that's an okay condition. You are not assuming A and B both are equal to right? So now if you kind of do this, you can, so, so, so this is the way, but we'll do it in the polar coordinates and I'll show you how much more simpler this is. Or maybe you should try it on your own. But see here you can, this is the way it breaks down and you can do it. And, and this is a division that we use a lot of times, okay? But we typically do it in polar coordinates. 
uh, but th this is in uh, we will do both division multiplication and division in polar coordinates now just to show how simpler it is compared to that but but this is the way you can take real examples try a few examples i don't know three plus two i plus i don't know four plus seven i and divide it and see what comes to its form like same things like that so just practice a few times so that you remember this again the, the reason why i'm saying this is this is part of what you call the Tolos gate. There is a specific gate in quantum computing that I did not talk about last time. Okay. I talked about the C0 and the Hadamard gate. Okay. There is another gate called the Tolois gate, okay, which is an important gate, which, which is a part of which is this. A part of which is a quotient between two uh, superposition states, between two qubits. So, so this is how you derive it, and, that, and that's why this is important, especially in polar. Now we will get to uh, Mr. Sai's favorite Demos theorem, which will probably come if you are multiplying two complex numbers using polar coordinates, okay? which is an important theorem, by the way. Okay? Again, the proof of it, I will leave to the more interested folks. And if you are not able to prove it, come back to me. I'll, I'll prove it. In fact, I don't think, I think if you multiply, the answer is obvious. I don't think we'll even have to do it, right? So let's just take two complex numbers. R1, theta 1. R2, theta 2. Okay. Two complex numbers that you're trying to multiply. But they stand in polar coordinates. Polar. Afterwards, somebody Google and tell me why is it called polar. Okay. You know why it is Cartesian, right? It's it's after the name. It's after it's a, it's after the guy, John Cartesian kind of came out with Cartesian. Why is it polar? Is it, is it after a guy called polar? Okay. This can be written as what? R1 cos theta plus I uh, R1 sin theta. Right? Multiplied by R2 cos theta plus I R2 sin theta. Correct. So just multiply. I will just read this out because I don't want to calculate again everything. R1, R2, it becomes what? Maybe you guys should do that. Cos theta 1, cos theta 2, minus sin theta 1, sin theta 2. Just, just multiply. It. There is nothing uh, complex that I'm doing here. I, R1, R2 sin theta 1 cos theta 2 plus sin theta 2 cos theta 1. Yeah, so if you just do some more trigonometric simplifications, it just becomes R1 R2 cos of theta 1 plus theta 2. Right? Trigonometric identities. Remember, right? Cos of theta 1, theta 2, cos theta 1, theta 2, minus sin theta 1, theta 2, 12th class, lot of by hurting. Yes, <laughs> yes. People don't, don't prove it. Uh, I I kind of look at my son, some of his syllabus, it's very funny. Okay. They just, they just teach everything, they teach everything like a formula only, where people just by heart these identities. Not very complex identities to prove, actually, if you, if you, if you want to. Sine of theta 1 plus theta 2. So the multiplication. So by induction, if I have R1, R1 theta 1, comma, or whatever, or multiplied by R2 theta 2, Rn theta n, I can write it down as R1, R2, R3, Rn, comma, theta 1 plus theta 2, correct? This is a very important result. If you are multiplying a set of n complex numbers, the, it is just a product of their modulus. Okay. With the angle being 
the sum of all their angles, all their theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. And because it's 360 degree, now you can start visualizing. Right? The same one will have multiple solutions, right? Because if you have something, then you add the angle, add the angle, and so at some point you come to 360, it will again keep rotating. So it will be, again, I don't want to discuss it right now, but this is what will be the phase of the qubit when you actually talk about it, because every qubit is a complex number that can be defined in terms of a magnitude and a phase. Phase is the theta. Magnitude is this. It's basically every complex number, every qubit will have a magnitude and, a, and an angle. The angle is the phase of the qubit, phase of the electron or the photon or whatever. So if you multiply the energy states of various quantum qubits, this is the result that you will get. And it's so much simpler in polar quantums. Right? It was not it, it was not so much fun when you were multiplying it, right? Especially for n, it's definitely not fun. It's going to be horrible. It's an important result. Just, just keep it in mind. By induction, it's just a question of product and sum. Now we will take a special case of this. Special case will be a fun case. So again, let me write this right up there because R1 into 1, R2 theta 2, Rn theta n equals R1, R2, Rn, comma, theta 1 plus theta 2, theta Okay. Now let us say this. What is this then? Power and two. Power and two. Power and two. Power and two. And theta. Correct. When R equals one, then? Sign. Very important. Very, very important result because unit vectors. Entire life is unit vectors. If you do that. Now, out of this comes the de Moer's theorem. Instead of writing this, I can write this as cos theta plus I sin theta equals cos Correct. The third saw. This is known as. I don't know the French guy's name, but those French people's name pronunciation spellings are very hard. But it's basically called the De Moore's theorem, and it's a very very key result in uh, actually in all of complex theory in all of complex analysis especially in quantum computing this is probably like the first letter a okay uh, then you got to write, write 25 more letters but first letter a is this we will use this theorem so many times that by the time i'm done with this class you will remember it <laughs> like this is it there's no question about it cos theta plus i sin theta to the power n is cos n theta plus i sin n theta Now let's do one more example and then I think uh, we will kind of leave, we will go to Lagrangian mechanics a little bit because I want to finish both today. There is too much to finish, so I don't want to you know leave things because that, that way we will never get done with this. Probably, I will probably get done again. So, 
told us when we were studying, we don't know yeah, how this can be applied. I remember yeah. them just introducing the nuance directly is to solve no context, nothing. Just remember this wrong value. Yeah, so then, then we used to, we got only for, we learned only for marks. Ah, no, no, that was a self learning but even in the class, yeah, I think part of the problem is teaching also yeah. because what happens is, see problem. the professor also, what happens is he, when he comes, when probably year one when he started, he was excited. <laughs> okay. Students up in so many years, they have made him feel that was nobody cares about this shit, nobody wants it. After 25, <laughs> 30 years, he just wants to go home and retire at that point. He just wants to say something because he knows anyway nothing will go into anybody's head. I, it's a problem is both sides. Problem is definitely on the teaching side. There's no question about it. Okay? Because uh, when I see how my son is taught some of his math and things like that, it's just ridiculous. Okay? You don't teach math like that at all. Uh, it's just nonsense. Uh, uh, physics also, I see the same thing. He doesn't understand anything. Okay? He just keeps challenging on things and all that. So when I have some time, I do it. But I also don't have all the time in the world. And of course, when you're 17, 18, you don't want to learn this also. That's the other problem. <laughs> <laughs> but if we know this can be applied in real life in some this kind of things. And you will realize that there's a point of time. Not at all. Yes, but that time is really fast. See, even I did not realize when I was 17. Right? So I can't expect another 17 year old to be. So let me be truthful to myself. My mother did not recognize me. I recognized it only when I was 25 or 26. It's the age I also realized. So, to 17, I was also a different sort of person. Everybody is different when they are 17. It's not like that. But, so I'm not blaming anybody, but what I'm saying is, there's so much beauty in this. And it's a, it's a tragedy that people just say, oh, math is difficult, I don't like math, I can't do math and things like that. It is not difficult. What is difficult about it? For example, why is this useful? Let's say extracting roots. Let's say I want to extract the sixth root of i. Suppose this is the question I, I, I have. Which basically what I'm saying, that the sixth root of i, I want to find out what what is it. I think about it for a second. I'm asking for some arbitrary root of i. Okay. So typically, what I will do, what I will do typically, I will say sixth root of i is then some x plus i y. See, that's the other thing in math you should you should get familiarized with again the context. Whatever ridiculous question I ask, it doesn't matter. Okay. You should try it. Just put it in a logical order. The answer will flow. You don't have to worry about it. See, in math, that's the whole thing. You that's why I say shut up and calculate. Just calculate. Don't have to put too much brain in it. Uh, what is sixth root to me? You will get there. I promise you, you'll understand what it is. But first, unfortunately, you have to go through. Then if you keep doing it, then you can take the sixth power on both sides, for example. Then i equals x plus i y to the power six. Now we use some damn binomial theorem expansion. Okay. Now I, I have done it, so I will write it. I won't again do the binomial. <laughs> so I'm going to write something like this. It's just to show you how bad some things can get. 15x4, what is it? IY square plus 15x square IY4 plus IY6. See, by this time you would know that all the even things are simple. I square is minus 1, I4 is minus 1, I6, so I4, I6, so you, you kind of know that, right? With all the even numbers, the i's cancel out. It's only the odd things that you have to keep, at least. So this plus, you have all the odd i's now, right? 6, I5, I, Y, plus whatever, 20x cube, I, Y cube, plus whatever, whatever, whatever. 6x i y 5. So now, if you actually think about it, if you break this down, the whole thing and all that, you will get some equations. The equations will be like this. I, bear with me, there is a reason for this madness. 15x 4y square plus 15x square y 4 minus y 6 equals 0. 6 x 5 y minus 20 x cube y cube plus 6 x y 5 whatever into i or whatever equals 1. 
because square square you get minus one. So if you solve these two equations, you can solve for x and y. If you kind of do all the drama and if you do it, you can do. Okay, Cartesian, right? Now let's do polar, and I'll show you how much fun it is when you are doing it in polar. So this is the nonsense you have to do. If you have to do it in Cartesian form, the answer will come if you, you can solve it. But I don't think anybody enjoys solving this. Okay, you can solve it. So I equals one by pi by two, right? Y axis, imaginary axis, pi by two, right? And here it is one because it is I, right? Now, if you actually imagine sixth root of I is some R theta, correct? Now, one by pi by two, sixth, you you multiply, right? Six by six is equal to what? It is one only R six, which is one. Correct. Six into pi by two. Correct. N N theta. Six into pi pi by two, which is you you kind of do this, it becomes that is the answer. So wasn't it easier? So this is just to tell you the importance of moving it into polar coordinates. When you are doing things, always doing polar coordinates, especially in quantum computing. We don't even bother about x plus i by here. Okay. So I think I will next week, I next this Friday or Monday, we will start on. Functions of complex numbers and calculus of complex numbers. See, the subject is called calculus of variations. If you have some time, read about it a little and come back. And come. It's called calculus of variations. Calculus of variations has nothing to do with complex numbers. It is a calculus of variations, which fundamentally it's a fancy way of saying all calculus vary. Because as things vary, you want to measure the rate of variance. That's what is calculus. No, what else is calculus? Calculus is just rate of variance. So now we'll quickly, what is the time? Maybe I'm run out of time. Maybe do you, do you yes, sir. yeah, does everybody have 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes? I'll close Lagrangian. On the phone, guys. Yes, sir. Okay. So I'll quickly close that, okay? Uh, because I think Lagrangian is easy enough. Uh, Hamiltonian will take time. Hamiltonian will, that time will faster as a bit. <laughs> Again, there also you should look at People who've done some fluid dynamics, curl, divergence, things like that, it becomes easy. But I, I'm not expecting that you guys will remember it. I'm sure you've all done it. I'm sure there are fluid dynamics classes that you have sat through. But fluid mechanics and fluid dynamics, uh, Stokes Navier and things like that, you might have sat through those classes, but they have no exponential. <laughs> so, so Lagrangian mechanics. Now this is very, very important. This is actually very important. It's a tragedy that they don't teach it in undergrad level. Do they teach you in undergrad level engineering? I don't even remember if they. Huh? What is about IIT and non IIT? Syllabus is syllabus. Syllabus syllabus. They won't get it much. Okay, so Lagrangian, I don't remember. I only remember this is the Galaxian option. Ah, correct. Very good. So let us say you have a simple problem, right? Pendulum, the, the world's oldest problem. <laughs> okay. Now, how would you solve this in, in the Newtonian world? The, 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 the Newtonian world is all about calculating acceleration using some force. The, this is the governing law, right? This is the governing law of Newtonian mechanics. So you calculate forces, you get acceleration, and then you start integrating acceleration to get whether velocity or displacement or whatever you want. If you want to understand how the particle moves, you calculate velocity at every point. But first you calculate acceleration, right? And then you integrate. So that's how Newton did it. That, that's the whole Newtonian thing. Now, if you look at this, okay, 
in the newtonian world what nobody teaches you unfortunately a lot of people don't remember this see there is a downward force called mg correct on on this there is some upward force called t some tension in the wire okay that that kind of exists now the whole point is there is no equation for tension if you remember like for example if i want to write friction angular momentum whatever there are equations that down if i want to write electricity there are equations but tension there is no equation okay because this is a set of what you said the set of forces are called constraint forces these are a set of forces which only come into play as a as as a uh, as an opposite force to something else the, and the constraint force are very very complex because it determines it is determined where exactly in the wire you are measuring the density of the wire the impurities in the wire it measures on so many things exactly on it's actually in physics they call it permeability in the in the permeability of the substance okay so it's a constraint force there is no easy way to write this maybe you can derive this in some way from laws of conservation of energy or momentum or something you can take and then you can derive some expression for this but there is no standard expression you cannot write so in newtonian mechanics we do a we do a slay of hand we do a trick okay because this is calculated by every 11th 12th class student but most people don't understand that that trick that they actually use what they say is this tension remains constant so the motion of this pendulum is a circular motion ideally it will not be pure circle right because there will be some elasticity somewhere it will go a little more or a little less there is no string that will that will let you move in a perfect circle like that it never happens but but that is the simplification you take once you make that simplification this force is irrelevant for you you just solve it in terms of simple trigonometric cosine theta the component of this force in that direction right you you just do this or whatever come here you just break this force into the sine and the cosine component and you get some answer called minus g by l sine theta or something like that if i remember right that's the answer you will get minus finally ah good i still remember so that is the answer you will get an acceleration uh, which is whatever s dot dot and then you keep integrating you keep integrating you want velocity integrate you get velocity you integrate once more you get displacement so this is how newtonian mechanics does now this is really not the right way to do this can i tell you why there are a lot of issues with doing this now i am not saying that newtonian mechanics is wrong or anything it is very good for what we have to do but there are many situations where it is not enough and lagrange was 100 years after him so without newton there probably wouldn't have been a lagrange <laughs> so don't get me wrong don't go around saying she said that newton mechanics are wrong or stupid i don't say anything okay, they are they are as usual but now let's say i have a scenario where i have a pendulum and i have an another pendulum now how do you now if i want to understand the motion of this how do you do that you you, you get into some some problems right now this is again mg there is some tension t1 some tension t1 some tension t2 okay m1g m2g right so this is kind of the forces now you have to calculate all of these forces last time we did a visor ray out okay because we said circular motion now this may move in a circle this definitely if this moves in a circle this is not circular Okay, you understand this. If this you are moving, this will not be circular. This will be some irregular, horrible motion. Okay, it will not be a regular motion for this ball anymore. So what do you do? So now you are kind of stuck because you can still do Newton, but it is going to be, you know, there is actually, um, I don't know, the, if you actually look at Newton's book, Principia Mathematica, where he actually writes that. I'll send you. It's actually. Do you remember that Nobel? physicist n chandrasekhar who was a nephew of c v raman who got a nobel prize for physics some uh, early uh, late 90s right. yes. late 90s a guy called n chandrasekhar yes. 
See, he did a yeoman service. He basically translated Principia Mathematica into English. <laughs> okay. He translated Newton's book into English where he proved most of his theorems again in English. Okay. In that book, if you actually, I, I don't expect you guys to go through it. It's only mad people like me will go through it. But if you read it, it it's Principia Mathematica in English. Okay. I'll, I'll send you the link. A PDF link is there. Okay. You don't have to buy. Don't worry. Don't buy that. <laughs> he just takes the original Latin and writes it in English. Now there, Newton had solved this problem. He had actually solved this problem. Now that solution is about 23 pages <laughs> of conservation of momentum and things like that. So you can solve it using Newtonian mechanics, but it is very, very painful. And so Lagrange came up with a better way to solve it. And I will not get into too much math right now because I think uh, you guys also must be losing patience. Okay? So Lagrangian, okay, is called T minus U. It is written as T minus U. What is T and what is U? U is kinetic energy. T is U is the potential energy of a of this particle. So he says you can write the Lagrangian as the difference between the kinetic and the potential energies. Okay. I'll tell you why this will come a lot in, in, in quantum mechanics. In, in quantum computing, we will we will calculate the Lagrangians of us to understand the energy states okay. but this is what it is so it is written as this and now he says the path that this particle will take or this object will take is you can say between time t1 and t2 if you want to understand between two time frames how will this particle move he says it is going to be an integral between t1 and t2 of n of the Lagrange with respect to y, y dot and of course whatever the variable here is, which is time. It's time, time if you want to make it displacement, you can, if you want to differentiate on, integrate on x, you can integrate on x, you can integrate on anything. The, the key point is whatever you are, it is, it is going to be such that this function needs to be minimized. This function needs to be minimized. That is the path it will take. The path that will, the function that will minimize this integral. And I'm sure what I'm saying, the function that will minimize this integral is the path that the particle will take. Okay. How do you find out the function? I don't know the function, right? We just know the Lagrange. How do you know the function? He says the function that will minimize this integral describes the path of that particle. So once you know the path, you know the velocity, you can double integrate and get whatever. Now here comes the most important equation that you should remember. It will come back in quantum computing again and again. It is also once more it is Euler Lagrange equation. The man Euler was incredible. Okay, The amount of stuff that that guy did is incredible. He says the equation is d here there's a bit of partial derivative. It's like this is what I said. I'll probably do review of uh, variational calculus next time, but I'm hoping that you guys know a little bit about partial derivatives for me to write the Euler Lagrange equation. Okay. DL by DQ, and I will explain what Q is minus D DT. Uh, this is not partial, sorry. This is not partial. Uh, this is complete. DL by dq dot this is the general form of the equation the function if you solve this the function that you get will be the function that will minimize this integral which in turn will describe the path of this object okay now let me explain this equation a little bit and let me give some intuition about what this actually means okay? the q here just means any coordinate system on which you want to calculate. So, so for example, if you have a three dimensional space. X, Y, Z, right? So Q can be either X or Y or Z. If you want to calculate in all three, then there have to be three Euler Lagrange equations, one for each dimension. So, you want to, so this is the function that will Describe its path in that dimension. Okay. 
So if you have x, y, z, this should be partial derivative of Lagrangian with respect to the x, uh, uh, partial derivative with respect to first derivative of x equals zero. Similarly, that will describe its 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 movement in the x direction. Similarly for y, similarly for z. Actually, for people who are interested in neural nets, you can also use this equation to describe the convergence of neural network waves, and we will get there later. But just wanted to say, tell you that all this is combined. So that's why when people tell me they're a data scientist, I, if you understand deep learning, you need to understand everything else around it too. It is not just about time, okay? Because you can, because this is called energy-based neural networks. You can, you can actually do that. Okay. Anyway. The Euler-Lagrangian equation also describes that because you can describe it in n dimensions. There is there is nothing stopping here. Of course, in physics we do only three because this is actual world where we want to describe things in three dimensions, right? We are not describing things in n dimensions, but mathematically you can describe it in n dimensions. Right. So I will solve just one example for you to say that this actually works. And <laughs> And then we'll call it a day. But that, ah, what is the intuition behind this? The intuition is this Lagrangian is called the action. So what it means is, if you can think about it like this, whenever a body moves under the under some force, it tries to keep the difference of its potential and kinetic energies constant. That is what this actually means, minimization. Okay. So if your kinetic increases, if, if, if your kinetic, then your potential should automatically come down and other way. And that balance is what creates that path. It is as an object is trying to traverse, that's what it tries to do. So he just, this is simply derivable from conservation loss. You can actually take conservation loss and you can derive Lagrange's, uh, Lagrangian. Okay. It's not something, and that's what he did too. It's not like he created, this didn't come out of on his own brain, right? He just took conservation loss. So conservation loss, and, and that's why conservation laws are so important. Both Newton's laws and Lagrangian laws can be derived from the same set of laws. The same laws of conservation of momentum, energy, and angular momentum. If you take those three laws, and you actually uh, try to write equations describing the path, you will get both the Newtonian and Lagrangian. You'll also get the Hamiltonian, but we'll discuss that later. Only quantum breaks it. Again, <laughs> quantum, there are some weird effects that kind of breaks the conservation loss to some level. Though some physicists say it actually does control and things like that. But anyway, that's that's a different story. Okay. Okay, so now let's solve one problem. Guys on the phone, I'm just going to pause here for a second. Anything before I can go? I know maybe I did a little more math than I should, uh, but uh, I can't end this without telling you this because this is the founding equation of all of quantum information computing. Okay, it's the Lagrange Euler, and it's not very difficult. Just imagine it like this: you are trying to take the Lagrangian with respect to some coordinate system, and you are again trying to take it with because the reason I'm saying time is you are, you, are, you usually try and measure its uh, development over time. If you are trying to measure it over space, then you can take space also. There is nothing that is stopping you from. But this is not partial, huh? that's important. That's very important because I'll show you when people do the derivation, they make the mistake. This is not partial derivative. This is the total derivative. This is a partial, and this is, you don't forget the dot here. This is with respect to the first derivative of the coordinate system. Okay, so don't forget the dot. Uh, if I give it an exam, most people will make a mistake exactly there. So don't. Anyway, you guys are there are no exams, so it's okay for you, I think. Maybe you never know with me. <laughs> but as of now, you're safe. I'm not putting exams. Okay, so we'll just solve one simple problem and we'll say that. Say if if you draw if you throw a ball. Goes up, comes down. Let's say you want to describe this motion. With with Newtonian, it is trivial. I just want to say Lagrangian, but even with Lagrangian, it's trivial only. But let's just say it, okay? What is the, what is the kinetic energy? Come on, man. Correct? I'm generally doing this notation. It's V square only. V square is nothing but first derivative of displacement, which is Y. What is potential energy? 
MGH. Right. Correct. So what is L? So what did I do? Yeah, now let us calculate all of those things. What is DL by DY? Tell me. At least let me see how much of differentiation, partial differentiation you guys remember. Correct. This is constant. No. Yeah. With respect to Y, this is constant. See, I have one assumption I am making here. Y and Y dot are independent random variables. Otherwise, it becomes complex. You understand? Y and the derivative of Y are two different random variables. If if I don't make that assumption, then Y dot will have to be there, there has to be a derivative of y dot with respect to y also, and that will be. I'll have to explain that relationship between y and y dot because a derivative is not a relationship, derivative doesn't operate. But so, if you have x and if you have 2x, that's just a multiplication, they can still, right? dl by now dy dot this, right. Because two two can cancel. Yeah. Now you do the D D. Uh, I'm also writing as partial derivatives. D D T of D L by what is that? M Y double dot. And they are with respect to time, velocity is this is acceleration. Mm. So if you write this equation, this is very simple. Minus mg minus my double dot equals zero. Correct. Mm. Y double dot equals g. Did that was not worth the effort, right? You know, you know it was g. Yeah. You know it was g. You just throw all it comes down. What is the acceleration? It is g. But you derived it using Lagrangian. There's one more problem that I wanted to solve, but I don't know if you guys have the time. Otherwise, we can solve the pendulum problem. Homework try. Try solving that one pendulum. Don't have two pendulum. One, pro one pendulum problem solved by Lagrangian. Okay, that is not very difficult. That's not at all difficult. Okay. The only thing remember is remember it is the full derivative of time with respect to the first order derivative of y. Remember that because I know where you will make a mistake, where everybody in my life world makes a mistake. Don't make that mistake. Okay. Do that for homework. So this one. Just one. Two, two I will solve in class if you want, but one you solve. One is very, very simple. Just write poten what is the potential potential energy? See, it depends. If you take y here, it is mg y. If you take the thing here, then it's minus mg y. Depends where you're taking the coordinate system, right? Near or kendo, whichever. If you're, take, you're taking this is 0, then it is minus y. If you're taking it below, then it is y. So, whichever it is. And the kinetic energy is just kinetic energy. Just do that and then do the Lagrangian, put it in the Euler Lagrange equation and solve. And solve for acceleration. Okay. Fantastic. Was it useful? You guys learned something new today? Yes. Recollected a lot of things. Very good. Very good. So one problem that I said electrical engineers are next day or thing. This guy. <laughs> this was see. my examination sir actually. In first year and I did. Oh okay. Good. Lagrangian, huh? Uh -huh. Yeah, this is a uh, for, for an exam, I think it's easy box they have given me. What is that? It's all good. Yeah, but it's probably only two marks. Uh, okay, two marks is fine. They should have probably put three pendulums, and then the fun begins. <laughs> Calculate the potential. The pendulum question was for eight marks. Eight marks. Okay, good. So it's all like that. Then Hamilton, you didn't have either. Then I had it in post year or something. Okay. So now, see the one thing that I wanted to tell you was: let's imagine there's a circuit. Okay. Let us imagine there is. Okay, there is some light bulb here. Let 
that is an assumption to be huge nonsense here. Okay. And then there is some, and then this is connected to. Oh, okay, let's not connect it to the light, but that will not be. Right. I will do it the other way. And that will be a little more. Fun. Okay, so let's just say you have a light bulb here. Pardon my drawing. Okay, and then there is some some circuit that you will open or close. Okay, and now this circuit has got a long wire. Okay, it's connected to the bulb. It's got a long wire. Okay, now let us say the length of this wire. Now this distance between the circuit and and this is let, let us say one meter. Okay, just one meter. Now this one, let us say, is 300 million meters. Mm. We are saying 300 million because the distance that light travels in one second. Okay, 300 million meters. Light travels in one second. It's the whole length. Uh, anyway, this drawing is not right. Let us just say it is like this. Okay. So the whole length of the wire is like that. So divide it accordingly, right? So this is one fourth of it. This is some 75 million. This is 75 million. This is 75 million. And this is 75 million. Maybe be a little bit distance. Here. This distance is probably uh, not too much. Okay, maybe very less. Think about it like this. Now the question is: Once I collapse the switch, I join. I I, I make it a circuit. Okay. How long does it take for this light bulb to light up? Does it take one second? Okay. Does it take? Like, let me say, I'll give you options. Does it take one second? Does it take 0.5 second? Let us take two seconds. Or let, let, let it take one by C. C being the speed of light in meter seconds, right? So, one by C. What is the answer? Point per second. Point per second. Hmm. The answer is one by C. Okay. Why? Because uh, distance. And... No, one by C is the right answer. No, why? That is the critical part. Why? What? So. So it already there is there is um, like some particles are within the circuit. But it has to connect and to go there. So that's why we calculate it as one by C. Then why is it one by C? Then it, if if electrons have to flow through this wire, then it is one second only. Mm -hmm. Because light will take one second to travel this distance. If we if you are talking about flow of electrons, the answer is one second. Okay. But but there is a reason why it is one by C. The gap left, you distributing, right? the gap. Sorry, somebody is saying something. Say. <laughs> It is distributing uh, in all the directions. No, no, there's something has to do with this. Say, you guys are electrical engineers. I know one thing. I will remove this here. Okay. I, I, I will remove this connection here. What is this? If I, if I put the switch on, what is this? It's a open open circuit. Yeah. Yes, sir. I remember transistor. I wrote it and I forgot the capacitor. <laughs> <laughs> so it is just the electric field it will just flow. It is just capacitance. So it will be like it doesn't even matter. So here it may get 0.5 seconds, but far before that only it will the, the, the bulb will light because it is just it is just acting like a capacitance. Okay. So you don't even need to. Because whether you put this or not is inconsequential. Anyway, that was just electrical engineering 101. Just, just wanted to insult a few people. <laughs> oh, no, sorry, my guys. That's <laughs> no, I, I also took some time initially. Then, then that, that, that was the brainwave for this question. You should not think about joining. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, electrical engineering is a very interesting discipline. Unfortunately, nowadays I hear everybody only wants to do AI and data science. 
<laughs> it's so very sad. We were very, very attached until the two one second year first semester. But what happened? Some you saw some girl, huh? <laughs> no, what happened second year first semester? No, like, <laughs> after that we lost because huge subject, unable to. No, that's okay. No, I'm not. Okay, man. Thank you, thank you, guys, and uh, thanks, Madhu. Thanks, Anik. Thanks, uh, who else? Uh, Tamachari, Akash. Uh, I don't know. Uh, who else joined? Varsha. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Uh, Shrini, if I have one minute. Ah, oh, please. Yeah, go on. Uh, no, because you have given a couple of homework, so I just want to tick away one homework. Just want to check my understanding about the polar coordinates, where it comes, gets its name from. I think uh, it's the radial distance from the pole. That is how it got the name, that yes. theta angle. Yes. Yes, you're right. Uh, I read that in terms of kernels. So I just thought I'd check. Okay. Yes. Yes, you're and right. Srini, uh, yeah. And you also gave this question, x plus y is equal to 10 and x into y is 40. The question. Um, yeah. I don't know if I'm right or wrong. It says both x and y are the same, like 5 plus or minus root 15i. Correct, you are. Yeah. And that is where the complex numbers comes in, right? Y yes, yes. Yes, that is where in that book called Ars Magnus, that was published in 1545, that is where Cardano actually tried to solve the problem and he said it's a ridiculous problem and threw it out. Okay. <laughs> But that that is the that is the very beginning of what is a complex number and how complex number. So I gave you the problem just for you to see. We are not the first people. For six hundred for thousand years, humanity has been struggling with what that complex number is. So that's good. My good, good, good. I I like the effort. I hope you guys have tried solving it and not looked over Google. But that's up to you. I don't. So, but that plus or minus pi, even it is for plus or minus no. plus or minus pi. No, it is five. Plus or minus root 15 i. I or something. Well, it will be minus 15. This i comes later. This will be the solution. How about the plus or minus pi here? No, that is not the solution for this problem. That's all. Quadratic equation solution. You get that. It is not. Can be, but it is not in this case. That's all. Super Varsha, I didn't get to try it within the class. I'll try it later. And I'm if like, I can't, I'll it, take your help. It felt like my intermediate question where, you know, you, you have two variables, multiplication, addition and all. Oh, so just gave I'm it a head. Yeah, I'm liking that you guys are trying to try it. It's not a very complex question or anything. Try it out. I just wanted to get you because that was one of the original questions in that book. It's called Ars Magna. If anybody's into it, you can even read it. It's still available. It's easy to like equate with your uh, uh, multiplication Correct. equation you gave that a square plus b square. It's easy with that. But if we are trying with a plus b into a plus b, it becomes a very whole calculating thing happening here. Yes, that is why neural networks work. Representational re learning. If you can put it in the right representation, you can solve a problem. Half, half, 90% of a problem is trying to figure out the right representation for the problem. And that is why you have to spend time looking at a problem. If you spend time looking at a problem, you can usually get a better solution than trying to jump at something. That's why teachers keep telling you, don't look at it. Unfortunately, some competitive exams in India, you don't have a way out, I think. But typically speaking, if you if you keep looking at formula, it doesn't work. In real life, it just doesn't work. In real life, you have to think about the problem for a while. Spend a few days. That's why whenever I give a problem, I don't expect immediate answers. So, but, but I hope somebody thinks about it. That's the whole idea. Thinking is not as easy as thinking is not sleeping. Thinking is difficult. <laughs> if you actually have to think about a problem, it takes a lot of energy. Right? You got to think about something. Why is this? Why does this happen the way it happens? You have to think. If you think, you will come to some conclusion. I don't want to forget it, but you'll we'll come to some conclusion. Anyway, I think that's good, Varsha. Thank you for your efforts and uh, thanks, Madhu, and thanks, everyone else.